This is IAQ Radio, indoor air quality radio, the voice of the indoor air quality industry, with your host, Radio Joe Hughes, and the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick. And now, Radio Joe Hughes. Good day, wherever you're listening from, and welcome to IAQ Radio Plus. This week, we've got a great show with Dr. Steve Spivak. We're calling this one an interview with an industry icon. Reflections spanning half a century of advising the worldwide cleaning and restoration community. We're going to have Dr. Spivak, and then for the roundup, we're joined by John Donny and the restoration industry's global watchdog, Pete Consigli. Before we get started, we want to thank our marquee sponsors. IAQ Radio Platinum Sponsor is John Don Products, where restoration and abatement contractors shop. Visit them at johndon.com. That's J-O-N-D-O-N.com. I also want to thank our gold sponsors, Particles Plus, Healthy Indoors Magazine, Gray Wolf Sensing Solutions, and AEML Inc. Laboratory. And of course, our association sponsors, the Indoor Air Quality Association, and the Restoration Industry Association. And now you can win a cool prize. It's time for the IAQ Radio Trivia Question. Be the first to correctly answer. Simply email your answer to czlotnik at cs.com. Or if listening live, just text your answer from your computer. And now, here's the Z-Man with this week's IAQ Radio Trivia Question. Hello, everyone. I'm happy to report that Tom Barnes EHS LLP in Greenville, South Carolina was first to identify Duncan Fife as the 19th century American cabinet maker known for incorporating a harp into his furniture designs. The IQ radio trivia question for today, Friday, September 21, 2018, has been sponsored by Ideas, the solution chemistry company creating unique solutions to odor removal, surface cleaning, and decontamination problems. Here is today's question. What happened on today's date 48 years ago that changed sports history? Back to you, Joe. Thank you, Cliff. All right, this week's guest is Dr. Steven Spivak. He is the chair of the Cleaning Industry Research Institute International's Science Advisory Council and a professor emeritus of fire protection engineering at the University of Maryland in College Park. He served as the technical advisor for the Restoration Industry Association, formerly known as ASCR International, for almost four decades. In that role, his monthly column, Technical Topics in CNR Magazine, was a favorite with our RIA members. Dr. Spivak has authored a book on standards and best practices, and he has written extensively on textile construction and chemistry and fire protection codes and practices. His writings serve as an authoritative, authoritative resource for the dry cleaning and laundry industry and code officials and building developers. Welcome, Dr. Spivak. Do we have you on the line? Thank you, Joe. And with that profound introduction, I'm so pleased I'm ready to sign off. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hang You're in very there. kind. Well, thank I'm, you for joining us. It's I'm been, here. Um, we had you on back in 2008. And, uh, you know, we, we, you were on episode 93. We're up to 517 now. Um, what have you been doing interesting related to cleaning, disaster restoration, textiles, and indoor environmental quality? Well, thank you. The timing is correct because 10 years ago in 2008, the Cleaning Industry Research Institute, and if I refer to it by its acronym CIRI, if I say CIRI, I don't mean the digital assistant, but I'm referring to Cleaning Industry Research Institute. In that year, Siri formed its new Science Advisory Council, which was then uh, formed and chaired by Dr. Michael Berry, and we held our first cleaning science symposium. And a year or so later, when Michael Berry stepped back from some of his many um, and important responsibilities, I was honored to become the chair of Siri Science Council. So for this last 10 years, I have been kind of project manager, research overseer, and um, supervisor for a a group of 
very well known and accomplished science advisors whom we work with on the Science Council of Siri. Let me take one more moment just for listeners who don't know CIRI. The website is CIRIscience.org. As a dot org, it's what we call the IRS of 501c3. So Siri is not for profit. It is not a typical industry association. It's really unique. It is independent, unbiased, focused and research driven with science based outcomes as what we do. And the byword for Siri that we refer to is, quote, only science can see, which effectively means everything that Siri does is based on scientific evaluation, scientific testing, um, solid procedures to evaluate soiling, surface contamination, surface hygiene, cleaning for health, um, disaster restoration science. Uh, so that is an overview of CIRI. And uh, Jim Harris of Janitronics Inc., uh, Building Service Contractors, is the Siri chairman. He was one of the founders from over 10 years ago. And we are now honored to have John Downey as the new publisher and will be the managing editor of a cleaning science quarterly, which Siri will be launching um, this fall. Wow, great to hear. I mean, I, I, you know, we want to be much more involved with Siri as, uh, you know, I think under John's leadership, you're, you're going to be a little more active and a little more out front uh, in this industry. We really look forward to having you on more often. And, and, and John, of course, will join us for the roundup. Um, what role, if any, are new discoveries and knowledge about the microbiome having on cleaning methods uh, currently and then cleaning science research? Yeah, that's a fascinating and very timely question. Um, and just as a quick qualification, I am an engineer of 30 years fire protection and textile engineering at the University of Maryland. But with Siri, we work extensively with microbiologists. And so the issue of the human microbiome is really critical to all of your industries. What's happening is uh, there are extraordinary advances right now going on in molecular biology, new ways to characterize and understand bacteria, viruses, yeasts, mold and fungi, uh, examples, the use of immunoassay to identify pathogens such as Clostridium difficile, to identify mold spores in restoration. Um, simultaneously, we have um, an almost radical and dangerous growth of hospital-acquired infections around the world that are continuing to uh, increase. And so antimicrobial resistance, anti um, um, Superbugs and pathogens that are resistant to uh, the common treatments, the antibiotics that we have, are being looked at in ways of trying to better understand and maximize human hygiene, the ability of brilliant ability of humans um, to protect themselves, and underpinning that is an increased focus. We've long said it, but still not well done. Effective cleaning, cleaning for health and hygiene, using science to really understand what are surface contamination and the effectiveness of surface cleanliness and, um, and professional restoration. Um, again, I think you probably better know MRSA, which is um, methicillin resistant Staph aureus. So all of these superbugs are becoming more and more dangerous, more and more prevalent. And so the sophisticated microbiologists are looking at the human microbiome, its own brilliant 
uh, system to try to protect itself combined with effective cleaning for health. And that issue of the microbiome, I'm certain, will come back, um, whether it's this coming year, 2019, at the Ceres Symposium, or in the future. Um, I'll end by saying it's a new word for a number of people, but in the whole issue of uh, human health and hygiene, that's one of the new operative terms that's become critically important. Cliff, let me turn it over to you for the next question. Okay, thanks. Um, Steve, are you aware of any new trends in cleaning that you know, have, have happened within the past eight years? Or 10 years? Yeah. yeah, the major trend that CIRI has been a principal part of is in our partner with um, uh, ISSA, uh, the global, one of the global cleaning uh, industry associations, uh, CIRI through its principal researchers, Gene Cole and Richard Shaughnessy, developed two clean standards based on, I think a number of your listeners will understand ATP, adenosine uh, triphosphate, as a marker for uh, surface contamination and surface cleanliness. Um, the major trend that we see, and it continues, is that the eyeball check is ancient, it's ineffective. Even techniques such as UV lights or black light can tell you where cleaning operatives or restoration operatives have been, but not what they've accomplished. And so we at Siri are convinced that the use of ATP which is being done by some premier restoration, cleaning contractors in hospitals, uh, nursing facilities, that needs to really be adopted by the industry. And we are now close to 10 years or more, and it still has not achieved the kind of recognition and adoption that it needs. And so a major reason for being in Syria is to continue to promote a change and an increased focus and trend on the use of ATP as a measure of effective cleaning and restoration. That cliff, I believe, is really the principal focus that we see as a new need and a new trend that has to come to fore and has to replace marketing hype and puffery in terms of cleaning and restoration processes. Thank you. I'm wondering, as a follow-up to that, I, I just, I was going through articles. We send out some current events with each show announcement. And uh, one that I was looking at, I don't know if I included it this week or it'll be next week, was on cleaning biofilm and, and how difficult that can be. And then right. uh, this current technology was kind of using more of a mechanical means of cleaning as opposed to trying to disinfect and, and, and destroy or, or kill the organisms. Uh, is Siri doing any research in that area? One of our, what Siri does is in, we both do research, public and confidential, but we also rely on the expertise of our um, science advisory council. And one of our members, Dr. Greg Whiteley from Australia, oh. um, is on the, has been on the program and I'm sure will be again in the future. Um, on research he's been doing and publications on, I think he calls it um, the bio, this biofilm versus slime, effective cleaning, and particularly his focus has been in uh, hospital um, ICUs. And so Greg particularly has peer-reviewed research and will be presenting, I would expect it could very well be at the Siri 2019 symposium that will be this coming July 2019 at Miami University of Ohio. But that's an area where Greg Whiteley, um, if I'm speaking for him, he's really brilliant and accomplished in looking at how to break down these very pernicious and persistent biofilms, um, and especially where they will find themselves in crevices and resist effective cleaning um, 
in hospital ICUs. So look to the future is my answer and the next series symposium because I expect we will have Greg focusing particularly on that issue. But it, again, it's a very timely uh, concern, Joe, that you've raised. Now, you mentioned earlier the Siri cleaning study in schools, and I'm wondering if you could give listeners some of the big takeaways from that. We, we did have Richard Shaughnessy on a while back, and he, he talked a bit about that, but I'm, I'm curious what your big takeaways are from that particular study. Yeah, the takeaways, and it resulted actually in two ISSA.com clean standards, and I believe... I haven't just recently looked. I believe they are openly available. So there's a clean standard for schools. And then separately, there is a clean standard for buildings and public occupancies. Uh, the former is a little more rigorous in terms of its specifications using ATP and other ways to evaluate uh, surface cleanliness. Uh, the latter meaning for facilities and public occupancies is a bit more practical in its specifications. The takeaway is, again, only science, in this case, principally ATP, um, and ATP luminescent swabbing, is really the way to effectively understand whether it's disaster restoration, uh, professional cleaning, or even routine janitorial and uh, maintenance procedures. How effective are they? Can they really um, beat the claims that are being made for them? And that has to be recognized and adopted by the professional cleaning, the JANSAN, and increasingly by the disaster restoration industries. And my perspective and understanding is we are still far from uh, broad-based acceptance. And so the takeaway is if this has to change. I expect Siri will bring back in 2019 um, its certification program with lead trainers on the use of ATP for um, cleaning effectiveness and surface hygiene. So that is really the major takeaway but the sad point is we're not there. It's going to be a radical change in thinking, and it has to come. It must come. Joe, if I might. Um, uh, Steve, an interesting thing uh, that I ran into uh, over the course of last year was uh, one of the ATP companies developed some alternative technologies that were pretty interesting. and. Mm -hmm. Um, what they developed was a similar type uh, testing device as is used in ATP, uh, not the reading device, but the actual uh, swabbing uh, devices that are used. And okay. what happens is you don't need a machine in order to use it. Uh. And what's interesting is one of the things that they look for is protein, and another mm -hmm. thing that they look for is sugar. And it's interesting in that these are instantaneous so that if someone was doing cleaning and wanted mm -hmm. to know, the, the supervisor could actually go in after them. And what they would do is they would you know, swab the surface and they would wait for four or five minutes. And what happens is these things change color. So essentially, right. if it's green, it's good. You know, if it's purple, mm -hmm. it's not. And again, it's pretty interesting in the tests or the cost for the testing has come way down. This was under a couple of dollars a test. So pretty interesting technology. So I think you're right. <coughs> the companies that developed ATP are kind of extending it out and looking for uh, some other things as well. Correct. And I was guessing as you were speaking that the procedure was probably a colorimetric marker, mm -hmm. which it is. Um, it, it shows well, there are really two challenges, and you've hit on them. One is for people increasingly to adopt ATP, even without the, spe the specifications for the clean standard for schools or facilities, but really as a kind of um, a screening technique to see how well their products and their procedures are doing. But separately, I have a colleague and many of our 
cleaning science advisors with CIR I do. I have a colleague in Germany and where I've been promoting that they, he in his research use ATP, the cost of the swabs, he gave it to me in euros, is two or three times at least the price of the swabs here in North America. <laughs> so it's critical, you're correct, that the cost of the swabbing plus the devices have to come down before more and more people are going to adopt it. But it leads to increasing focuses and better methods to rapidly and efficiently assess um, the hygiene and cleanliness of a surface. So it's well said, Cliff. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that uh, there were two of these studies, and I, I didn't realize that, so maybe on the blog, Cliff, we could make sure we get a link to the, the study in the buildings. Um, I know the school's one was still free, but at least the last time I checked, and um, I think the buildings one is, is a very important uh, document that people need to get. I, I just, an observation from, from my perspective, there are at least more companies now using ATP than there were in the past. Um, at least there's been some recognition, Steve. So I think, you know, what you guys have done has is, is led to some uh, changes and, and it may be slow, but at least um, at least some people are coming along. And uh, in fact, I just used it not long ago to help with a project in a medical office. So um, mm -hmm. glad to see some people are getting out there. With your, you know, you've got a great knowledge on uh, standards and expertise in standards. In fact, I saw you speak at the uh, IICRC annual meeting, uh, I think it was two years ago, and, and, you, and that was the topic you talked about was standards and... Correct. Uh, in Washington. Yeah. It was or, a, yeah, in, yeah, in Washington with the IICRC with their trainers. Tremendous presentation. I really enjoyed it. Try to you know, show the difference between a standard and a guideline and things of that nature. Um, will Siri be getting more involved with standards these uh, now? It's the answer is it's possible. Um, we have not been really a standards-driven organization in the past, unlike IICRC, for example, um, uh, IAQA or others. But where our interests continue to lie is in our science. Uh, oriented approach to cleaning and restoration where, for example, existing standards, and I could put in parentheses any number of the IICRC standards or others, where people continue to question what is the science underpinning the decisions in that standard. So you know and I know that IICRC asks the questions, but there are not always sufficient answers. Siri has the capability and the expertise in the future to look at doing the research to try to better define what is what are the scientific correct answers that lead to the outcomes in a standard or and I'm reaching a little bit you know I'm being careful but in the absence of that being done by others Siri could conceivably, and forgive me, quali you know, disqualifier, I'm speaking personally. Siri clearly has the expertise and the capability to look at developing standards that will fill voids or absences, uh, particularly with Siri's um, expertise in having science lead the decision making and the, and the outcomes. So the answer is up in the air, time will tell but we know that we have the capability to do that where there is a void or an absence in others having uh, accomplished that. Let me, Joe, add one sure. item. Sure. Um, that, and you're very kind, that, it was a 90-minute presentation of mine with PowerPoints. Just this past year, I represented, apparently IICRC did not, so I gave my only a copy of that videotape DVD in high quality back to IICRC to put on its website. And so for those trainers, you know, lead certifiers, master uh, certificates who are um, IICRC members, they should be able to get onto the IICRC website 
and actually pull up that complete presentation on national, regional, international standardization and restoration. So um, I guess as the presenter, I had the only copy and they came back to me about a year ago and sure enough, I had the world's one copy and I made copies. So IICRC has them for you or any of your listeners who can get into their members only website. They'll be able to view that. Oh, if, I might, if, I, if I might, um, Steve, <laughs> in kind of getting prepared for, for this particular show, we started uh, writing a blog, I don't know, maybe 150 shows in. And I went mm -hmm. back and reviewed the show because I was going to actually, I listened to the other show and, uh, and I was going to combine a blog with this show uh, and, and the prior show. In going through, there was a reference that you made in the last interview the IICRC standard, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was S500. And okay. th the standard is named a procedural standard. And what was interesting is my uh, belief was, and my understanding was, is that it was a procedural standard because it told you exactly how to do what they wanted you to do. Step by yes. step, you must do this, and this is how you do it, and, and this is highly recommended, and, and so on and so forth. And in the interview that we did with you, um, what you called the attention to was that the use of the term procedural in the document's name uh, most likely was because they followed the ANSI procedure in terms of putting the document together. So I, I just uh, wasn't sure if you could clarify. So. Yeah, um, you may be correct. But one of the questions and the issues you also raised is whether where a standard is either procedural or prescriptive, meaning mandating the processes and having much more rigor and effective acceptance in liability or court case issues. So it could be procedural because of um, it being an ANSI IICRC standard and under you know, recognized standards development procedures. But it is also procedural, as you say, in terms of specifying this is what you do, this is how you do it, this is the way to do it. And those procedures um, and the terminology used, and I'm sure both you and Joe and many of the listeners understand, is very critical in terms of when one is an expert in liability cases and the issue comes up, what is um, the accepted industry standard or the accepted industry practice and procedure? So the terminology in terms of what is a process or a procedure versus what is a prescriptive requirement um, is very critical in terms of how those terms are viewed. Um, very interesting. Steve, let's, um, we've got about two, three minutes before halftime. There's one more question. Cliff, do you want to go to the recap, the study question real quick? Yeah, we yeah, can. Yeah, that's a great one. Yeah, we, okay. we can. Well, uh, could you please recap your study, a preliminary investigation of the effects of ozone on post-fire volatile organic compounds uh, for our listeners, Steve? Yeah, um, it's a wonderful question because what – that led into in the question from Cliff and Joe was, can that study be redone specifically with reference to what many of your listeners know are the um, increasing use of hydroxyl radicals and hydroxyl generators in restoration techniques, whether it's restoration for smoke odor, for musty moldy odors, for diesel spills, and others. The answer is absolutely yes, it can. The procedures would be very similar. Um, I know we're approaching half time, but um, I can either begin now to say how that can be done and why it's very appropriate to try to clarify the science of hydroxyl generators in restoration. Or, Joe, do you want to tell me how close you are to your half time? And then we can come back and I'll go into a, a quick recap of what I did on with Nelson Dunstan on 
um, use of ozone in remediation and uh, gaseous chemical changes following um, fire and smoke odor and how that might be applied to hydroxyl generators. Give me a time uh, signal, if you would. Sure. I, I think it's a great uh, topic, and therefore, I think maybe we should just go ahead and do the halftime, and that way you won't be you know, cut into when we go into the topic. So, Okay. Up, uh, thank our sponsors at halftime. We'll be back with the second half of our in interview with Stephen Spivak, Dr. Spivak. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about his reflection spanning half a century of advising the worldwide cleaning and restoration community. IAQ Radio Platinum sponsor is John Don Products, where restoration and abatement contractors shop. Visit them at johndon.com. That's J-O-N-D-O-N.com. Gold sponsors are Particles Plus engineers and manufacturers of feature-rich particle counters and air quality monitoring instrumentation. Learn more at ParticlesPlus.com. Count on us. Healthy Indoors Magazine, a free online digital magazine for industry professionals and consumers. Subscriptions available at HealthyIndoors.com. And AEML Laboratories, free FedEx shipping, great pricing, same-day results, and never a rush fee. Learn more at AEMLinc.com. Gray Wolf Sensing Solutions, who use advanced sensor software technology and embedded computers to provide superior environmental test instrumentation. Visit them at WolfSense.com. Association sponsors are the Indoor Air Quality Association, a multidisciplinary organization dedicated to promoting the exchange of indoor environmental information through education and research. Learn more at iaqa.org and RIA, the Restoration Industry Association, the granddaddy of the restoration industry. Network with leaders. Learn more at restorationindustry.org. Okay, we're back for the second half of our interview. We've got Dr. Steve Spivak on the line here, and we're talking about a uh, preliminary investigation of the effects of ozone, a post-fire volatile organic compound. This was a study that was done, uh, Spivak and Dunstan, in 1997, and we're talking about how that may um, eventually be maybe replicated type of study for hydroxyl radicals. So, Dr. Spivak, please... Uh, let listeners know a little bit about that study and then how you think it may work with the hydroxyls. Thank you. And wherever the listeners hear me say ozone, just wherever I say ozone and the gas sampling just fit in the current interest in hydroxyl radicals and hydroxyl uh, generators. Uh, what we did was um, I was 10 years department chair, fire protection engineering, University of Maryland has a world-renowned program. But amazingly, we have two purpose-built single-layer butler buildings that our faculty and grad students do fire research in, and sprinkler effectiveness and others. So we've got these interior smoky, charred, odorous fire odor buildings, but completely controlled, contained, controlled access. Nelson Dunstan was a chemist graduate student and what we were able to do is go into this very smoky, um, charred environment and then eventually measure and characterize all of the volatile organic or gaseous species in that smoky room and odor, which every one of your fire and disaster restorers has faced, and then expose for multiple times uh, concentrated ozone in that space and then come back again with gas sampling, very sophisticated GCMS uh, ga chemical uh, gaseous analysis and look at the changes in uh, chemical species as a function of the ozonation. And so I think it's well known and published by others. You will get significant changes in many of the gas species. Uh, we swept at least 20 or 30 or more different chemical species uh, before the ozonation in the smoke-filled environment and then after. 
and then increases in aldehydes and ketones and knowing what effectively is the change. Um, let me tell you that what was amazing about this, because it affects how to do it again, is that Maryland has these facilities. I actually did this research with Dunstan with no external funding. So all of the ozone monitors, all of the gas sampling equipment, um, all the samples were on loan or donated by US EPA. All of the very sophisticated gas chromatography mass spectrometry, these chemical analytical methods to determine what changes in the gaseous environment, in the air, um, what changed as a result of the ozonation, all of that work was analyzed by then air quality sciences, which is now absorbed into UL environment. That was a fortune in chemical analysis of which they donated for the benefit of good research for our industry. So it is expensive to redo this kind of research, but I think the message here for Cliff and Joe and the research people who are listening is there are ways that peer scientists and first class um, industry corporations can donate willingly their time and expertise to help with a first class research project like this. So it could be done again. Let me end by saying the challenge, if one wants to fund something like this, I can tell you to fund a graduate student for a year is, and depending on the university's overhead, twenty-five, thirty-five, forty thousand dollars $40,000. It's a lot of money, could be more uh, with all the equipment. Um, whereas if by manipulative thinking as we did, quote, we bootlegged our way into this research by hook, by crook, and by donation, it can be done and it should be done I was uh, an expert witness on a major um, uh, diesel fuel spill, multi-million dollars of claims where one of the issues was the efficacy of ozonation. And although it was not done, there was subsequent questions, should hydroxyl generators been, have used by the restorers in lieu of ozone? So the answer is I don't know, but it's a very timely question and the research should be done, and I'm probably not in a position to do it, but I'm willing to help, Joe, any of your colleagues who've got the research uh, orientation, um, the, the ability, uh, Cliff, someone like Randy Rapp in Building Sciences at Purdue University, whom you and your colleagues have supported, if they want to do the work, I would be more than willing and happy to share the approach um, and the expertise um, to assist them. Steve, it needs to be done. It's, you're absolutely right. It needs to be done. You know, 30 and 40 years ago, um, the advertising for ozone machines, and you'll still see it today, that, you know, it's like the smart uh, chemical. Well, first of all, they say it's not a chemical. Then they say it's smart and, you know, how it seeks out and destroys bad odors, doesn't cause any damage, breaks everything down, the carbon dioxide and water vapor. And if you yeah. look at the advertising for the hydroxyl radicals and the hydroxyl generators, it's exactly the same. The same. You know, it's, like, it's like penicillin cures everything, including headaches. And they're selling, <laughs> these, they're selling these machines and renting these machines. And I mean, I've seen projects where they've spent six figures for renting this equipment. Wow. And it just took so long for it to work when traditional methods of the way that it was done for many, many years would have had people back you know, for much less money. So I do think that something needs to be done uh, definitively, and I'll do anything I can to you know, push people uh, in that direction. Because if you look around, uh, you know, there's a lot of junk science with it. And uh, mm -hmm. you know, people that aren't scientists publishing things and it gets parroted and repeated and so on and so forth. So I think they really do need to do a study exactly like the one that you did at the University of Maryland, because I think it educated uh, a lot of people. Yeah. And genuinely, I, I and even our Science Advisory Council, you know, experts with CIRI would be willing to support and help anyone who genuinely would like to do that science to really look at the efficacy or not 
of hydroxyl generators in, uh, in classic restoration techniques. My Maryland resource was these two amazing smoky fire, you know, filled butler type buildings. Um, but any other application or even redoing that is, is critically important. I'm wondering if um, with the hydroxyl generators now they're, they're stating that people can still be in the building and that um, mm -hmm. during this process, I wonder what, would you feel comfortable still being in the building with those generators running? Um, without knowing or having done the science, the prudent answer is no, I would not be comfortable being in the environment. I'm sure you and Cliff, I can go back 10 or 20 years on seeing ozone generators by analogy where people have said, oh, just take that person who's in, back in his office smoking cigarettes just put my ozone generator in his office, shut the door and turn it on, and he'll be fine. So prudently, without a clear medical answer, the best uh, approach is, no, you don't do it when there's public occupancies. And even if, if, hypothetically, there is a potential lower risk lower health risk in the hydroxyl generators. Here is the conundrum. That does not negate chemically sensitive, hypersensitive, asthmatic individuals whom where other people normally might not be affected. You all know that you can get a chemical exposure of whatever type, or in this case, a hydroxyl radical generation, and one person out of so many is going to be so sensitive or so immunologically compromised that they will stand up and say, and say, that's it. And they fall over or out they go. You've seen it. I've been in it and in come the lawsuits, you know, so it's just not a prudent thing to do, even given, you know, the supposed claims by the suppliers. I apologize for the long answer, but huh? they're really, they're unique questions. You know, one, one of the th you know, I think one of the things that we're thinking about, and it might be, uh, I think, thanks to the EPA and their concentration on particulate matter under 2.5 microns, you know, when you're mm -hmm. oxidizing stuff, are you creating particulate? You know, and, and this is something that may not have been looked at in studies mm -hmm. before, but I think that, you know, in all the advertising I've ever seen for hydroxyls, the only thing that I've ever seen potentially negative was that it took time. There was never mm -hmm. any negative consequence. And, you know, if, you know, I just can't see that there's a, a substance on earth that doesn't have negative consequences. That's yes. Or again, going back to, you know, the byword, it's Siri, whether it's only science can see or if you permit me, quote, we take science seriously, C-I-R-I-O-U-S-L-Y. You've got to do the science, the gas sampling, the, the particulate uh, sampling in the air, pre-treatment and post-treatment to really understand what happens. And uh, to an initial approximation, that's what Nelson Dunstan and I did many years ago. I guess 20 years ago, um, it has to be done now for hydroxyl radicals and it has to be done for the next new magic bullet that comes that, you know, that comes into the, uh, the professional restoration field. Sure. Cliff, do you want to do one more question before we go to the roundup? Um, I'm good. I'm good. Let me, go, let me just so that we can kind of set the roundup up here. Um, could you just, kind of give us an overview of, for, for listeners, for, for people who do restoration, who are, you know, trying to evaluate products or evaluate techniques, technologies, etc. cetera. How, how would you help, help them with differentiating between junk science and real science? Um, part of the answer is, uh, is two. One, the new cleaning science quarterly 
of which uh, John Downey is launching this November, and I expect we will have copies at the ISSA Interclean meeting in Dallas um, in early November. Look to that. It will be a continuation of what John has done before, but now in his arsenal are the full CIRI Science Advisory Council and an editorial advisory board. I don't believe there is another industry trade magazine or industry publication that's anything like having um, Greg Whiteley, Richard Shaughnessy, Gene Cole, Ralph Moon from GED Services, myself, John Richter of Miami University, Alan Ludke, and Michael Pinto, and then some. So forgive me, but I've just read off what will be uh, most of the editorial advisory board that will be building the foundation and the science of the new cleaning science quarterly. Secondly, our series symposia, which on average in the past have been uh, probably every two years, biennial, we are coming back, restarting that symposium, as I said, I believe in July 2019 at uh, Miami University of Ohio. And it is really fundamental and practical science applied to cleaning, cleaning for health, restoration, um, janitorial and sanitary maintenance. And when we do that, we peer review all of the research presentations. I've been doing it for years. So you do not get heavy marketing, heavy business approaches without science. When we do peer reviews for papers or a symposium, um, again, we have a common question that CIRI asks, show us your data, show us the results. Don't make claims without the research and without the data. So for any of your readers, I would encourage them individually, they could take on a subscription and John Downey can add more to that. Um, any science trainers, researchers or educators can join Siri for a fee and we'll get a significant discount at, the, at each of our future annual symposiums. So we believe and we feel confident that we are a unique resource for all of our collective multifaceted industries, cleaning, contract cleaning and maintenance, professional restoration, disaster restoration and remediation. Those groups, as you know, don't always talk to each other, but increasingly Siri is a bridge um, through those different avenues. So Joe, I hope that um, I've kind of, kind of in, in a way convinced your readers that we have a unique role to play and that we will partner with you at IAQ Radio in the future and make ourselves available. And um, on the wrap-up session, I'll let John Downey uh, speak to anything that I've left out. Well, thank you for that. And, and we're going to go to the roundup in just a second. Uh, while we've been you know, reconstituting Siri, uh, Cliff and I have been sponsoring a, a little conference ourselves. We call it Research to Practice. So, John, you want to lead us into the roundup with our uh, research to practice discussion. It's the 2018 Healthy Building Summit, October 25th through the 27th at Seven Springs Mountain Resort in the gorgeous Laurel Highlands of southwestern Pennsylvania. Network and practitioners, prominent researchers, and industry leaders in an intimate and informal setting. This year's theme is IEQ, Remediation and Restoration, Research to Practice. This is the only industry event that performs live research and links researchers and practitioners. Marquee sponsors include Hayward Score, Helping People Live Healthier Lives, and Particles Plus, Count on Us. All right, let's go to the roundup. We've got uh, Pete Consigli, I believe, joining us, and Mr. Downey himself, John Downey. John, do we have you on the line? Sure do. Thanks Good for having have me. Good to um, And Pete, do we have you? I'm, I'm here, Joe. All right. Wonderful, guys. Um, first of all, I think maybe we'll go to John. John, anything you'd like to add or any questions you have for uh, Dr. Spivak? Well, 
just one thing to kind of add or to maybe get a little bit deeper into when you ask the question, what's the difference between legitimate and junk science? Uh, and Steve kind of uh, went into it, but I, I would like to explore it a little bit deeper. And that is, and it's, o it's only one of the elements, but it's an important one. And that is um, peer review, uh, the process of peer review and a genuine peer review is what's needed. Uh, peer review can be done, um, well, a genuine peer review is, is done where you, you, you have a paper that is based on research, research and the information is provided, the paper is written, and then you bring uh, a panel of experts, subject matter experts in, who do not have the same perspective on things or the same, um, maybe the same perspective as even the authors of the paper to review it and critique it. And when you use peer review effectively, and when peer reviewers do an effective job with it, uh, it ensures that, that you know you aren't burying inconvenient facts. You aren't uh, emphasizing just the positive things, but you're trying, and and not just trying, but you are effectively getting to the um, really more deeper into the truth of the matter of what you're uh, researching. All right, thank you, John. Pete. And and may what? I may I just add that the peer review is always correctly done anonymously to the author of the manuscript that's been submitted. So the one or two peer reviewers transmit their information anonymously to John Downey or John's assistant as managing editors. That goes to the authors and back, but the anonymity allows for a very candid back and forth discussion, and that's critical in peer review. Great, great point. Uh, Pete, good Pete. to talk to Pete. It's been some time. Go ahead, Mr. Mr. Pathfinder Consigli. <laughs> hey, Stephen, how you doing? I, I'm really enjoying the interview. And Dowdy, look at you in that white t-shirt with that smirk on your face. You know, I, I don't want, I don't want I to take on an Ohio State t-shirt, but I decided you know, not to. I, I was just going to say, I don't want to take the show sideways and say, who are the Buckeyes planning on burying this weekend with Urban Meyer's first game back? But, but we can deal with that later. All Listen, right, Stephen, like um, I, look, I really have enjoyed the interview. Um, I, uh, I'm very excited you know, about the stuff that John and, and your whole group are doing with Syria. As you know, I, I, I know most of the guys on there and have worked with them for many, many years, um, e either, you know, through ASCR, RIA, and uh, IICRC, the summer camp. Hey, how come you, you, you only got my picture up there? I'm calling in on Zoom. Isn't John Faith going to bring me in? You know, I, I, put a little, I put a little gel in my hair, too. I didn't shave, but... I don't look as scruffy as Cliff does. You got you got my old fish photo up there. He uh, only used it as the photos of the pretty boys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, so I, I think that's really really exciting um, with the magazine and the technical conference. You know, with with the with having some real science behind it. I, I think that's what the industry needs. Um, you know, Stephen. Uh, one of the things in some of the questions, and I don't know if we really addressed it. You kind of got into the to the. Uh, um, you guys talked a little bit about the uh, use of ATP and all, you know, that was something back in the nineties when I was active contractor in California that we started using some of that ATP in different mm -hmm. processes on a lot of these sewer losses that some of them were covered by insurance, but many of them were losses that were impacted in uh, high end affluential communities where uh, there was some exposure by the cities to the counties and they paid for it. We used to work back in the day with people like David Beerman and Peter Sirk. You know, these guys were real pioneers on the front end before the mold was gold and all these things. And um, mm -hmm. we had different results with that. But now the industry is more sophisticated. They went down the ENC road. I think there is a lot. I love that word puffery because that was one of Marty King's favorite words, too. That you, uh -huh. you, There's a lot of puffery, a lot of BS out there, a lot of spin, particularly from some of these suppliers, uh, you know, who are unscrupulous, many of them. I mean, I think the early pioneer suppliers, you know, will help build this industry to this day on Cliff's Watch, 
and, and Cloyd and a lot of these guys, I, I think they were much more honest brokers. And even though they had benefit that they could be gained, uh, you know, uh, from participating in the associations and all that, uh, I think that they still help serve the greater good, even though they got personal gain. And I don't think that's the case anymore. So the, the question that I have, and we're not going to cover it in this one call, but what are your thoughts on clearing sewage losses? Uh, you know, there's not the same kind of methodology out there that we use for the mold stuff. And I think the industry is struggling with this. So any comments that you could help with the listeners and Cliff could put in the blog and go on the record would be very helpful. So I, I, that would be the one main thing that I would ask you to address if you can. Yeah, it's you've gone right into, I believe, the expertise and very significant of a long-term colleague of all of yours who are on the phone, and that's uh, Dr. Eugene Cole, who now you may know, but for the past year or so, is now Professor Emeritus from the School of Public Health at Brigham Young University. So Gene, I think, is headquartered back in his North Carolina abode. But Gene, about a year or so ago, um, did a major talk on uh, remediation of sewage and uh, the health effects of sewage. Uh, Gene Cole will conceivably be available to do that again, but it's so timely because of Hurricane Florence now having, mm -hmm. hit, you know, having hit and washed through what are the very prestigious and very large uh, pig farms, swine farms in North Carolina and South Carolina. Um, Gene Cole just mentioned it on the telephone to John Downey and I yesterday. They're anticipating much of that flooding in North Carolina, having carried the feces and the excrement um, of, or even chicken farms as well, well into massive flooded communities. So Pete's question about um, sewage remediation, testing um, what's really effective in getting it done, and then what do you do for post-clearance testing to be sure that the buildings or the homes, particularly from sewage or black water, have been um, uh, safely brought back to usable condition. So Gene is one of the experts on that. But we will do, John, we'll talk to Gene Cole about redoing perhaps, whether it's our symposium or a related CIRI event, um, his study and expertise on uh, sewage remediation and I guess post-clearance testing. But you're right on target, Pete. Hurricane Florence brought it right into everybody's yeah, front so lobe. Steve, yeah, let, let me comment on that. I mean, my, my history with, uh, with Gene goes goes way, way back. Uh, I actually did some cleaning for health stuff with him when, you know, when Shaughnessy had a, a lot of the EPA money back in the day. And, um, but he, you know, he's contributed and written a chapter for the WLS manual. He's, he's yes. done a lot of work with the IICRC. And, and much of his, um, much of his, uh, yeah, that's Jeff Cross trying to call me. I got, I got to, I, down here, I had to put his call over and, and, and I got to deal with him later, right? So I, I didn't have my phone on vibrate. But um, I think that the, the uh, Gene got a lot of experience before he went to BYU from hurricanes back in the late 90s and early 2000s, working uh. with guys like Brian Keaton and a lot of pioneers back in the day doing that work. Mm -hmm. And I know that he has a lot of, a lot of information out there. I remember visiting him years ago at the at the you know we got the first got the job at BYU, um, so I I do think that there really is a, there's a big need for that kind of stuff now. I think the industry's struggling on it, so um, you know look look forward to him. And also you know uh, I think probably uh, Mr. Bad Moon Rising. That's uh, that's how Cliff how we uh, the IAQA radio tagline. We have names for it for everybody, you know, on the show. And uh, I think you know I work with Ralph I think he's going to be terrific on there too so uh, anyway look forward to whatever is going to be coming out in that because I really do think that the industry needs that John maybe that should be one of the first up kind of things that you put um, in the you know in the next I'm assuming the first journal is probably already at production getting ready for the ISSA show but maybe the second journal see if you could do something on sewage on that um, you know, well, as a matter of fact you'll find there is a paper on sewage Oh, in the first one? Well, it's there you go. Authored by, uh, what's it, Gene Cole. 
Oh, yeah. Uh, you you well, you look at you. You see, he's got the smirk like he's like, he's like he, <laughs> wasn't that fox to the canary or whatever the deal is. All right, well that's that's good to know. All right, Stephen, thanks for your input on all that. Really fabulous. Pete, it's, it's awesome. great to hear from you. Thank you. All right. When does that first edition come out? And and is that just going to the Siri? How does that work? Just to the Siri members, or is it something that will be more widely published? How do we? How do listeners get it? Well, there w it will be in print form for Siri members. We'll also have some uh, copies available at the ISSA show. Uh, it is within about 10 days of going to the printers, and it w should be printed and um, ready to go out to ISSA around the 20th of October. Uh, all the articles ha are in. They've been peer-reviewed. There are three articles, and I, I'm actually very, uh, very, very pleased with the uh, content of this first issue, which it was important to me. Uh, is important to Siri. Uh, the, there will be the print issues of the uh, Cleaning Science Quarterly will go to members of Siri for the most part. Uh, we're trying to build a membership, and they're, they're really, they're, if I can editorialize slightly or promote a little bit, there are three classes of members for Siri. Uh, one is for scientists and researchers. The second one is for trainers and instructors. And the third classification for membership are, is our trade associations and trade asso the members of trade associations. So our vehicle for really distributing uh, Cleaning Science Quarterly will be, the, the primary one will be to, to generate, uh, I, I would call these um, partnership uh, memberships with the associations. And if we, you know, that's what we would like to do is work through them in terms of getting a, a greater distribution of the publication. It will also be available uh, a digital edition will also be available on our website and uh, at the website. You know, I, I'm not sure. Initially, I think it will be open to the public as membership grows and, and we need to protect the, you know, the, the value of the membership. It will probably only be available to members. But for special people like you, Pete, and, and Cliff, and Joe, you know that you're going to be on my you're going to be on my list, my comp list. Well, thank you. We appreciate that. Cliff, any final questions for uh, Steve Spivak? No, no. Uh, it was just great to talk to him again and uh, look forward to seeing him as soon as I can. Well, I certainly enjoyed this. Before we go, are there any? do you have any final thoughts or, or comments, uh, Steve? It's, it's always a pleasure having you. It's been too long. We'll have to get you back sooner the next time. Hey, well, Steve, thank you. Thank you for being in Dallas for the ISSA event. Yes, oh, well, good. I will be, we will have a CIRI booth, as we always do, um, at um, InterClean North America. So please stop by, uh, customarily, I and Jim Harris, our founder and uh, pro bono chairman, um, will be at CIRI, so please look for us, and I will look vice versa for our mutual friends. Oh, yeah, absolutely, then. That'll be great. I look forward to seeing you there. Me and Cliff, you know, we'll be down there with John. We'll be walking the hall and popping in on, you know, all these different sessions for a lot of the kind of related uh, groups under that ISSA umbrella. I, it's been a while since I've been in one of them. I'm looking forward to it. So lo I'll look forward to seeing you then in, the, in a month or so, Stephen. Thank you. And likewise. And Joe, an extraordinary appreciative thanks to you and Cliff for your more than a decade of brilliant commitment to IAQ Radio. And I'm humbled and honored to be back again within 10 years. And if the Lord is good to me, I'll do another show 10 years hence. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That positive attitude. Thank you Thank so you. much. Uh, Dr. Steven Spivak for joining us this week on IAQ Radio. Another uh, great show. Really enjoyed uh, that. Enjoyed the chat. Uh, of course, Having the Restoration Industries Global Watchdog join us is always fun. And, of course, John Donnie, great to have you on. Uh, the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick at the controls. John, you got to have faith. Most importantly, our growing group of loyal listeners. 
Next Friday at noon, we've got Karen Dannemiller. Oh, you'll love this, John, from Ohio State in the Ohio the State. Ohio State. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to talk about her research on relative humidity and uh, microbiome and fungi and bacteria. And I think it's really a, a very important topic. Um, you know, the, the relative humidity in indoor environments affects a lot of things. And she's done some really interesting work on uh, how it affects, for instance, carpet. And uh, I'm really looking forward to that next Friday on the next episode of IAQ Radio. For IAQ Radio, I'm Spike Reed saying thanks for listening. Thank <laughs> you.